board for a children's chant or just to help me get us ready for what we're about to do in just a little bit. And we're going to make a mess, actually. It's going to be a delightful mess this morning. You know what's happening? I did tell you about that. That's the purpose of driving in with the preacher on Sunday nights. <laughs> awesome. So, all right. Okay, so what's the first day in the season of Lent? It is Ash Wednesday. What happened on Ash Wednesday? Well, we had a snowstorm, so we couldn't have it on. <laughs> but, you know, but, but really, yeah, you're right. So we, what do we burn? How do we, how do we get ready for Ash Wednesday? From last Easter. Or last Palm Sunday, right? So Kristen and I did that. And it was, I'm glad nobody was there to see it other than Kristen and I, because it was kind of funny, wasn't it, Kristen? It was yeah. scary. It was kind of scary, yeah. What did you do? Well, we, yeah, Nick, we, we got to plan a lot better next time. But what with all of that said, we got ashes here. Yeah. And so what happens is you burn it down. I do have a whole jar in my office, but I didn't want to bring the whole jar in here. But you, you pound it down. And it looks just like those are ashes from the palm branches. Yep. And then what you do is that's a little bit of oil. That's correct. Yes. So I put, I put some good smelly stuff in there, but I, that's right. Oh, cool. and what's what's the name of it? It's frankincense. And what do we? And what do you think the meaning of frankincense is? Probably. Can you can you pair that down just a little bit? So okay, let's give a hint. Um, what were the three gifts that the wise men brought Jesus the day when he was born? What was that, Michelle? Frankincense and myrrh and gold. Exactly. Yeah, right. So we put a little frankincense, and so then you you mix the ashes together. Yep. Yep, and you put a little oil in there, and then the key is, so then what we do is we put, I see the back of your hand for just a second. Is that, is that proper smudge? Does it need to be a little darker? Is that good? It needs, it needs to be a little darker? All right. So, but when we do this, um, what do you think the ashes represent? Well, yeah, could be. What else? Should we ask them? Yes. What do you think the ashes represent, congregation? Ooh. Dust. Dust, yep. Yeah. From dust you came and from dust you shall return, right? So then it also reminds us of our humanness and that there are times we make mistakes. Has, has there ever been a time you've made a mistake? No. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And do you ever ask for, for forgiveness? Do you ever say you're sorry? Yes. Yes. Try you try to. And that's what's hard, is that it's hard to say. Exactly. Look, I, look. Can I try that? I want to try that again. Oh, yeah, that's much better. See? Yep, just needs a little bit more. Yeah. So in ancient times, in, um, in the, um, the Jewish people would use ashes as a symbol to show God that they were sorry. So when we have ashes on our foreheads and on the back of our hands, it's a, time, it's a time for us to remind one another that, you know what, we're not perfect. Yeah. Right? And that we make mistakes. And then we hear words of assurance that God is with us in this journey. I know it does, it kind of smells, doesn't it? It's just a little, it hurts your nose, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put it's something, this, it's like a smelly sticker, right? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, on this day, we normally don't do this on the first Sunday of Lent, but I thought it would be important to do since we were stopped to do this very important ritual because of our snowstorm. It does look like mud a little bit, right? But it isn't. It just takes a little bit, and then that's what it looks like. But it reminds us of our humility. What does humility mean? You're not a robot when you're with you when you're humble. Yeah. What does humility mean, congregation? Well, that's the um no, that's not a very human but that we uh, hope is a, a way of being less not less than but more of a a person in a, a place of openness yep. and forgiveness. Yeah. 
So if he sees ashes on our foreheads later and he begs the hands, we know that we are open to hearing all kinds of things, that we can meet people where they're at, that there's a level of integrity and respect for the other, that we're going to use our words instead of our hands, especially when we don't like something our brother does or our sister does. We're going to talk it through, not that you would ever do anything. Uh huh. Yeah, I've seen some nudges. Yeah. Yep. But it goes for big people, too, that we need to use our words and we need to be loving to one another, even when we don't agree. And how do we do that in respectful ways? We did have one of those yesterday. So, my friends, let's take a moment to pray over these ashes. And will you repeat after me? And the congregation can repeat after me, too. Oh, God, listen with us. In the wild of this moment, as we try to find your voice, through all the other voices that echo and surround us, Pour your grace upon us and shape us into something new. Amen. Thank you so much for coming down and helping me out. And reading again from the message translation, we now turn to two readings, though your bulletin only says one. The first will be from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And thanks to David for reading this morning. Good morning. Good morning. First reading is from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then 12 through 17. Blow the ram's horn trumpet in Zion, trumpet the alarm on my holy mountain, shake the country up. God's judgment on its way. The day is almost here. A black day, a doomsday, clouds with no silver light. Like dawn light moving over the mountains, a huge army is coming. There's never been anything like it, and never will be again. Wildfire burns everything before this army, and fire licks up everything in its wake. Before it arrives, the country is like the Garden of Eden. When it leaves, it is Death Valley. Nothing escapes unscathed. But there is also this. It's not too late. God's personal message. Come back to me and really mean it. Come fasting and weeping, sorry for your sins. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God. And here's why. God is kind and merciful. God takes a deep breath, puts up with a lot. The most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Who knows, maybe God will do it now. Maybe God will turn around and show pity. Maybe, when all said and done, there'll be blessings, full and robust for your God. Blow the ram's horn trumpet in Zion. Declare a day of repentance, a holy fast day. Call a public meeting. Get everyone there. Consecrate the congregation. Make sure the elders come, but bring in the children too, even the nursing babies, even the men and women on their honeymoon. Interrupt them and get them there. Between sanctuary entrance and altar, let the priests, God's servants, weep tears of repentance. Let them intercede. Have mercy, God, on your people. Don't abandon your heritage to contempt. Don't let the pagans take over and rule them and sneer, and so where is this God of theirs? At that, God went into action to get God's land back. God took pity on their people. Here ends this reading. Second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Hear these words. Next, Jesus was taken into the wild by the Spirit for the test. The devil was ready to give it. Jesus prepared for the test by fasting 40 days and 40 nights. That left him, of course, in a state of extreme hunger, which the devil took advantage of in the first test. 
since you are God's son, speak the word that will turn these stones into loaves of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. For the second test, the devil took him to the holy city. He sat him on top of the temple and said, Since you are God's son, jump. The devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91. God has placed you in the care of angels. They will catch you so that you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. For the third test, the devil took him to the peak of a huge mountain. The unicorn gestured expansively, pointing out all the earth's kingdoms, how glorious they all were. Then they said, they're yours, lock, stock, and barrel. Just go down on your knees and worship me, and they're yours. Jesus' refusal was curt. Beat it, Satan. He backed his rebuke with a third quotation from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only God. Serve God with absolute single-heartedness. The test was over. The devil left. And in the evil one's place, angels. Angels came and took care of Jesus' needs. Here ends the story. We hear these readings knowing that our ancestors in faith found themselves in moments of great trial. There are so many questions in our heads and in our hearts that do not have answers. God's voice calls out to us through the prophets and the murmurings in our hearts assuring us my steadfast love for you will never end. I will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in all of the wildest places. We do not need to have the answers. We are only human. And God blesses us for every open, honest question we ask in the wilderness of this moment. Hold on to this grace as you receive ashes today. If you desire, I invite you to come forward to receive ashes on your forehead or on the back of your hands. And for those of you who are joining us at home, I invite you to place a cross on your forehead or on your hand and to know that you are beloved in this journey that you seek and seeks you. Let's take a moment then to receive these blessed ashes as we journey forth together in this season of life. Thank you. 